my subject is religion and culture. First, I'll give you an overview of history. When do these people emerge as a distinct group? The fact that some people were in the same territory does not mean that they were continuously Bengali, continuously this and continuously that. No, 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 no. The identity comes up from a recognition that we are now different. That X was a ruler of Bengal doesn't mean a dam. Let me give you an example. Bengal has to open Karo and you will find the glorious Pala rulers. Glorious Pal rule, which is the greatest of the pre-Islamic rules for 350 years in Bengal. The Bagas never spoke Bangalaya. So why do you call them Bengali? They didn't speak in Bengali. They spoke in Purvi Prakrit. They spoke in Prakrit. They didn't speak in this thing. They spoke in the language that was common to all of Eastern India at that point of time, starting from Azampur, all the way up to Assam. They were speaking in something similar and not understanding each other because everybody's accent was different. The last Hindu rulers were the Sains. And Sains were one degree worse. They were Kannada. They were Kannadiga Brahmins, the Sains. So I'm explaining that different ethnicities, different ethnic, different linguistic groups have been here. So when the hell does it start? Okay. Bengal is taken over through a coup d'etat in 1204 stroke 6. There are varying dates. So the contradictory dates are 1204 and 1206. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Two years, we um, will we'll give him study deep. Okay. So, 1204, which is almost the same time as the Delhi Sultanate was established. The Saints had become rotten. They could hardly govern. A bunch of adventurers, some say thugs, some say dealers. A bunch of adventurers came, just toppled him over, that's all. And they granted. So, that's the beginning of the Bengal Sultanate here, from 1204. Calculate from 1200 to 1757 Battle of Plassey was a period when we had broadly two groups of Islamic rulers. Now, whenever I refer to Bengal, what part of Bengal am I talking about? When we refer to the term Bengal, we refer to an ent cultural entity that encompasses both of them and also the state of Tripura. Perhaps what is not being said all the time the truth that is not being said all the time is that East Bengal, that is Bang what is largely Bangladesh today, and Assam were part of one state. So Bengal, Bengal hereby means the undivided thing, but the political reality that they are two different nations and have two different interests and often have, may have conflict of interests and issues has also to be realized. This entity actually comes up and why they feel so different, I have this two eyes creating my problem again. So why they are different, from the Palas itself you will find something interest, one part of Bong character coming out, Bengali character coming out. Whatever you say, I will be different. Whatever you say, I will be different. So while the rest of India was celebrating the resurgence of Vaishnav Hinduism and Shaiva Hinduism, Bengal went tuck to the Buddhist camp. Buddhism was khatam all over India, RIP, completely finished by the 7th century. Buddhism arose in Bengal in the 7th century, <laughs> so 8th century. 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th centuries, Bengal was ruled by the most powerful Buddhist ruler in history of India, the Palas. The Saints were a little pro-center, so they were knocked off, and then come the Muslims. So now you can say, ah, ha, ha, ab to Muslim aage na. Ye bhi sultan hai Turki hai, wo bhi sultan hai Turki hai. You know the first thing that they did? They said bye bye Delhi and declared independence. Elias Shah, Shamsuddin Elias Shah, one of the early rulers of Bengal, declared independence from Delhi because he realized that. In addition to the original Turkey-speaking soldiers that he had, 
he required local combatants and he picked up a lot of bengali soldiers but the they spoke in a different language that nobody had heard it was a variant of prak prakrit magadhi prakrit upper branch from which rose a new language that we can call proto bengali they brought with them and this bengali was nursed in the courts of the islamic rulers and boycotted by the brahmin class as shudra bhasha and what will they speak in dev bhasha so they went on speaking in dev bhasha sanskrit central agenda and these guys went on speaking in bangla without grammar without things sorted out and this is the origins in the 13th in the 14th century in the early stage the brahmins had not accepted bengali but very soon they started writing and they found it was pop popular all groups picked up including the muslims of course picked up and the early writers are chandidas brahman mohammad sagir a musliman and there were early writers and the language was started developing around this thing but the language has actually given a strength in the later centuries when sanskrit was infused at that point of time it was basically a language that was very local but the moment you started moving towards a richer vocabulary they found they had no option they had to go to sanskrit but by that time they had made these two mistakes of smoking drinking and he she he can't make out any difference so but they carried it but they brought in all these and in bengali has a very very rich vocabulary of sanskrit words where we have two types words that are exactly the same as sanskrit or words that are akin to sanskrit what we call tat sama tat bhava sanskrit enriches bangla to a large degree and this combination of austric words sanskrit words indo tibetan words farsi words put together in just the language which follows the grammar of sanskrit more or less and it goes on but all these languages were streamlined only in the 19th century it was in the year 1800 a college was established for bureaucrats in bengal the first college to be established for bureaucrats in outside the british empire anywhere was in calcutta calcutta writers building writers building the left wing had a college called fort william college and the contribution of fort william college to the literature of bengal a uh, literature of india is invaluable they said the grammar syntax prepositions constructions of sentences and even choice of words of three languages started with two the two languages were hindustani and bangla okay and then hindustani was split into two urdu and hindi then hindi was hammered through to be accepting the khadi boli hindi but about religion let me come to religion there are the three basic groups in bengal you must realize we had impenetrable forests dividing bengal from bihar and other parts whereas just south of bihar you get the hills coming up of the chota nagpur hills or in one word the jharkhand hills so to say these hills were densely populated with adivasis and tribals and the ganga valley was also deeply forested so that was a natural barrier why others couldn't come in so whatever happened on this side was a local kukari class everything was happening within its own what about the people the people here were basically three autochthonous groups 
three local groups. And these three local groups remain the hard stock of the people. One was the Jaliyas, we call them Jale, the watermen. It's difficult to call them fishermen because they are boatmen, fishermen, they have everything to do with the water. Remember, we have the largest stretch of water for any, any country, any, any country, any, any state in India. The second are the pastoral groups, broadly known as Yadavs, but Yadav is a very Sanskritized term on them. The pastoral people, those who keep cattle. And the third group is those who were occupants of the forests. These are the three hardy groups and all the groups of social groups of Bengal came out of these three primary occupations. Ha. <coughs> the upper crust, white cream, was almost always imported. Almost always. At various times, various preachers, various groups of mendicant, various groups came in, usually from the Ganga Valley. So, the autochthona stock notwithstanding and this large stock of people had different forms of folk worship, folk gods basically. And who are the folk gods? They are common all over India almost. Mansa, the goddess of snakes, Shitla, the goddess of smallpox. These are some of the common. And from the folk gods, we had formal religion coming in. Formal religion did not make much headway for a long, long time in Bengal. The hatred or the difference between Bengali Muslim and Bengali Hindu is certainly not that you see in the rest of India. Among the Bengali speaking people in the world, uh, which is right now uh, approximately 27 crores, 270 million. Two, they say Bangladesh claims it's 280 million, but 270 million is a good guess. 270 million, so it makes it from certain angles the third, fourth largest spoken language, etc. 66% uh, are Muslims. If you take both of them together, 66 persons, that is two out of three. But if you come to this part, it is around 28 percent, 29 percent, some say 30 percent. See here, three out of ten. <coughs> but as I said, these don't, <coughs> these don't, there has been a lot of Sufi movement here. There were a lot of counter Sufi movement like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who braced in the put in the bhakti movement here. These are all parts of history that I let others tell you. I have given you the broad picture that here, I, it's, here riots do take place, but where the maintenance of the Republic of India is concerned, it is not acceptable. And we will say that firmly, that is not possible nor acceptable. The solution they say is not possible nor acceptable. And we will all have to, this is where I ask you as my colleagues to hold it right. As it is, my generation has messed it up to this point of bringing it here. Now, over to you. You guys will have to maintain it. Thank you very much. Thank you.